So let's talk scalable CSS. I am a UI guy, full time, that's what I do. So I am thrilled that UI dev and JavaScript seem to have suddenly become cool. Uh, senior backend guys, uh, backend only guys, uh, are suddenly behaving very differently these days. They're becoming backend guys who are also willing to do front end. Um, their, uh, their ears are perking up when uh, I mention that I'm doing Angular training. Um, they do a sheepish little, well, can I come too? And uh, hardcore uh, Java architects, I'm seeing they've got a new tool to write. They want to do authentication or they want to do a, uh, an API for storage or something. And they'll write it in Node. Um, not just because they're trying to be hip, but because JavaScript does useful things really efficiently and really well. So people now, they know Node. They know about single page applications. They get that, that change. They get Grunt, they get Angular, they get Ember. They know about parse.com and OS X itself is now scriptable in JavaScript. We have JavaScript editors written in JavaScript, not one, two. Um, and they understand that the JavaScript ecosystem has suddenly become familiar to them, that it does all the things they expect it to do, that it has the tooling they expect it to have, that it's mature in the way they expect it to be. Woo! So truly, we have a set of three powerful uh, UI dev languages at our disposal that everybody loves and respects now. All three of them are equal, oh, wait, wait, what happened? You see, there's this awkward moment in conversations about UI dev uh, with an old Java gray beard or someone like that, where we're talking about JavaScript and it's like, yeah, 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 cool. And then suddenly CSS comes up. Why is that? Why is it, oh, come on, play. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Why is it that otherwise intelligent, rational people suddenly become practically bigoted when we talk about our, our lovely little language about CSS. So here's one especially telling example. Um, this particular guy that I work with is crazy, ridiculous smart. He's afraid of absolutely nothing in the technical world. Um, not even CSS. In fact, he wrote the, uh, the default drop-in SAS uh, sheet that our company uses so that you can get sort of, you know, instant branding with all of your colors and fonts and logos and everything else. He's the kind of guy who, when he gets some gigantic uh, Excel spreadsheet full of, you know, ridiculous business calculations that a consultant came up with, and he's told to port all of that code over to a web interface so that the logic can uh, get some data visualization tools uh, in JavaScript, he says, yeah, sure, I could do it that way but that would be boring. So how about if I instead figure out how to embed Chromium inside of Excel and then create an API for communicating back and forth across the membrane, write some advanced JavaScript uh, visualization tools inside of that, and he does it all in like a week or two. Why does that guy who can stand with the best people in this room or really anywhere say that CSS is an anti-language full of dark magic? So let's savor this expression for a moment. If, if CSS were merely a language full of dark magic, it would be something powerful but evil, like Voldemort. But instead, my buddy's trying to say that CSS doesn't even deserve badass street cred, that it's instead an anti-language, and so it's inherently something fake and synthetic and unreliable and wannabe, more like Britney Spears with her head shaved than he who must not be named, which is a, a pretty awful sort of comparison. So taking it for granted that my friend is just wrong about CSS, it's not an anti-language, it's not full of dark magic, where did he get the idea? And why do we care what he thinks in the first place? So I toyed with a couple theories about this, starting with the idea that maybe they're all colorblind, and uh, you might think so, based on the way that they dress compared to stylish UI people. But, uh, but no, they do multi multiplayer gaming and they frag the right people, so it's not color. 
So maybe it's fonts. Maybe they have an allergy to serifs or something. Maybe, could it be? Could they be responsible for the greatest aesthetic plague of our time? Uh, no, the scientists now tell us that the plague of Comic Sans was principally carried into the world by secretaries and administrative assistants, not by back-end devs. And if you've ever seen a, a Java guy spend half his day tweaking a new installation of IntelliJ to get his monospaced fonts just right and his code coloring just right, you'll know that fonts and colors aren't inherently their problem in CSS. Nor is it that CSS doesn't do cool things, uh, at least when you're not doing jerky screen captures with it. Uh, CSS does awesome things. Increasingly, it does things that we would have had to do the hard way in other languages, with JavaScript, and in ways that weren't hardware optimized, like our, our friend was just talking about. So what gives then? So I gave up theorizing and I just asked. I said to uh, these guys who made the ew face about CSS, okay, so what is it really? Tell me, give me specifics. And uh, while the results of my survey are entirely unscientific, they give us a starting place. <clears throat> so it boiled down to a few things, and a few things that were kind of shocking. Um, things that uh, we, we all pretty much take for granted. In fact, you can't really train somebody in CSS without explaining these things. Maybe not the third one, that's a little opinionated. But, uh, but the other two, and especially this third one, are, are kind of fundamental. All right, well, so what, what do you make of that? that? That that's what they complain about? Like, is it, it, there's two basic options, I think. One is, they just need better, better training, right? <clears throat> or maybe they need some motivation. Uh, I tried once saying, well, you know, CSS is really just, or at least positioning, CSS positioning is really just math and algorithms. And so if you're not really good at math and algorithms, I, I guess I can understand why you wouldn't like CSS. That went over really well. Um, I, I don't recommend it. Um, because it's not helpful. It's not that it's not really, really fun. I recommend it if you just want to have fun. Um, but if what you're trying to do is persuade people, that's not the way to go. So option two is to think again. Um, to think about those things that we take for granted. Those things like the cascade and specificity that we just take as, as givens. And I realized that maybe the signal that I'm getting from these guys I respect, um, and unfortunately they were all guys in my sample, I apologize for that. Um, maybe we can do better what we're doing and we don't have to wait for browsers to change to make it possible. We've been using CSS for so long now that we've maybe become a bit blind to the things it does to us, to the hoops it makes us jump through. Um, I've come to believe that the cascade and the specificity algorithm themselves are very cool ideas. They solve edge and corner cases in very important ways. But because of them, we've been fundamentally encouraged to do things that we should not do, or at least that we should try very hard not to do. They cause us, in many cases, to write CSS that's mushy, imprecise, overlapping, and hard to maintain. Um, code that normal humans, let's think about that, the browser understands it, but humans don't. And all code, ideally, the reason we don't just write it in ones and zeros, is so that humans can interpret it and predict the results without needing the browser's help, without needing an execution engine, in other words, to make sense of what's going on. So let's take a fresh start. Let's forget about the browser wars. Let's forget about the era back when people thought that uh, HTML was a document format, not a tool for building awesome interfaces. What would we want from code that we build cool interfaces from if we're starting from scratch? We want it dry. We want it maintainable. We want it predictable, which are things that you'll hear every programmer in every language talking about constantly. And I'm going to add another one to the list that you don't hear everybody say, but that I think is, is just as important. 
don't optimize prematurely or premature optimization is the root of all evil. So what can we do with that? How do we get there? The specifics, particularly around optimization, are very much open to interpretation. And my version of the specifics is pretty opinionated. But these, I think, are some general principles that we can probably all rally around. <clears throat> Name all the things. I put that TM there not because it's mine. I, I owe it to a, a, a good friend of mine named Chris Hoffman, super smart, young coder. And he makes the point that one of the things that we're just not taught, you can go to the fanciest CS program ever, and nobody will ever tell you that how you name things may be as important as everything else that you do in your application in terms of its maintainability. You can write a program just for yourself and not care at all what things are called. You can use hex codes to name everything if you want. As long as you read hex codes fluently, you'll be fine. But the second you want it to be maintained by anybody other than yourself, or even by yourself two days from now after you've worked on other things, um, naming things is critical. Classes. We can disagree about when exactly we should use a particular class, whether to stack them or not. But we can all agree that for some reason we've gotten it into our heads that classes, you can have too many of them. And that you can have too many letters in the name of a class. And I think we can make the case pretty clearly that that's not true. Be a lover, not a fighter. Everybody can agree with that, right? And the last one, again, a little bit opinionated, but I think you'll see where I'm going. It's time to automate if you haven't done it yet. So challenge number one in specific. Layout is the hardest thing about CSS. People figure out how to change fonts and colors in CSS within like an hour. Um, but layout takes much, much longer because there's much more going on. There's more possible points of failure, right? So this is the one common pain point that unites all beginning or part-time CSS devs, you know, those back-end devs who also do a little CSS, uh, in confusing them, in aggravating them. And I have, I think, a solution to much of what ails them. Um, if you care about making CSS, and CSS layout in particular, comprehensible to other people, I truly think that you could get 90 yards down the field with this one little gem. Uh, not the whole way, but a lot of it. The people who created this wonderful little gem um, that you've probably seen out on the interwebs. They're talking about floats. I'm convinced of it. Um, every bigoted anti-CSS developer that I talk about talks about floats. They say, why the hell, when I just want something to go over there on the right and stay put on the right, and I use the CSS feature that has the word right in it, does it not do what I want? Or anything remotely resembling what I want? Sure, some things move right, but it turns around and everything inside of it faces backwards, and then it screws up everything that comes after it. Instead of this top one, which would be a fairly normal toolbar, and then a header underneath it, or the one below it where you want your toolbar over on the right, you use floats and you get this. Either your, your header's screwed up in the wrong place, or if you are, are foolish enough to use float right, everything gets reversed and your header's in the wrong place. And this is a simple example, okay? If you've ever tried to throw a float into the middle of a complex layout that has a bunch of other stuff going on, it can just totally explode. Now, the very logical response of the people in this audience, the vast majority, is just use a clear fix, duh. But let's be honest, it's a hack. It's a dirty hack. And anybody who's in denial about its hackiness is, in fact, I believe, suffering from more than a little Stockholm Syndrome. Um, floats were invented for one reason and one reason al and alone to allow text to wrap around an image. That's why they exist. And because it was the guys at CERN who practically invented it, 
um, it was meant to go around an image of like a super collider or something. They were not, floats, were not intended to do what we do with them. So I know this hurts, but floats are the table-based layout of our time. Stop doing it. Unless you have to support IE6, um, or except in very specific, very discreet situations, like you've got that one thing at the end of the row that just needs to move over there and stay over there, okay, maybe. But otherwise, start making fun of the people who do basic layout with them. Don't hire people who say they've been doing CSS for 10 years and then do it all with floats. And switch to better options. So inline block, even though it has its own idiosyncrasies with vertical alignment and white space, it at least does something resembling what you expect it to do based on its name. And if you explain to people what inline is and what block is, you can then explain inline block and have them go, oh, right, I get it. It's like a paragraph that behaves like a character and flows across the page but takes up space. Okay, cool. You can explain this to a trainee. You can explain this to one of the old Java graybeards who are dabbling in a little UI dev. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, all right. It's not that inline block is, uh, is totally perfect, though. Um, Flexbox, on the other hand, is perfect, and I want to marry it, but its father says it won't be of age until IE8 market share falls below 10%. Um, the reason I love it is that it does what it should, the way your fellow coders expect. And if things do what they should, and you can explain it to the other people on your team, you win. You have a colleague who supports you and doesn't call you a witch who practices dark magic. And you get to stop fighting. You get to be a lover, not a fighter, right? Stop working around things. Stop hacking them. And you can build stuff that behaves rationally and provides a good foundation for that Flexbox future whenever it does eventually come. Um, and then my final note is just that uh, if, if for anybody in the audience is like, well, it's not that bad a hack. I don't even have to use extra HTML anymore to apply a clear fix. In order to do that, you have to have a browser that already supports not using floats anymore, okay? So, so just, just move on. And then here's where I get really opinionated and I'm gonna poke some people in a, in a way that they don't like. Um, I love accessibility, but I think that M's most of the time, in most cases, until you've proven a use case for them, are probably more trouble than they're worth. But I'm gonna let that go, because it's, it's there for you to just chew on and meditate on. So what's maintainability? Okay, we've addressed the, the, the one crazy pain point about floats. In a nutshell, it's readability and reusability. Now, very few people are gonna oppose readability and reusability on principle, right? Nobody says, I want my code to not be maintainable, to not be readable, to not be reusable. What happens instead is that some junior dev commits some stuff. And unless you spend a half hour staring at it, it's never gonna make sense. And so you go to them and you ask, and they say, well, yeah, this code's a little hard to maintain, but dude, it's optimized. Um, like it's a magic wand that excuses all sins that you wave it over. Uh, it does not. And the truth is that what we think we spend all of our time doing is not where we actually spend all of our time. We spend all of our time doing this stuff. So any habit that we have that's about typing less or making things be shorter or having there be less text on the page is probably anti-maintainability. So what is maintainability? Um, so Dr. one of my idols, uh, Venkat Subramaniam and others, they say premature optimization is the root of all evil, which I agree with. But I think that misses an important point, um, or another way of thinking about it. It's premature execution optimization, premature runtime optimization, that is the root of all evil. We're always gonna make a choice about what to optimize for. The second you sit down and start writing code, you're optimizing. 
writing code that is optimized for developer productivity and maintainability is never premature. It's never wrong. You may go back and refactor it later. But you're going to do that because you hit that sucker with a profiler. And you proved that in some meaningful way, your maintainable code is producing suboptimal results, some user observable latency, more than 100 milliseconds, let's say. If so, only then should you make non-trivial non sacrifices of the maintainability that you've worked so hard for in return for execution optimization. So let me be explicit, let me say it again straight up. I'm not against execution optimization. I'm not against giving our users fantastic, quick, snappy, near native experiences. Or against any particular optimizing technique. Again, if you're writing code, you're always optimizing for something. Just at the outset, know that it's your developers that are the most expensive, most precious resource that you probably have. Okay, if you're working for Amazon, if you're working for New York Times, you already have hundreds of millions of users. You have customers, and those customers make you a lot of money. They are extremely precious. Your developers will have to adapt. Okay, but if you're not in that position, chances are you need to optimize for what's rarest in your shop. Um, when you decide to do something else, do it with proof, not your hunch, not your assumption, not your prejudice. The, the evolution of the browser engines has made a lot of our old prejudices about performance outdated. Um, we could, someone far better than me, could spend an entire session just talking about those things. Um, so I'm just going to float it out there and, uh, and let it go. All right, so we're all on board with the main, main idea. How do we get maintainability? How does it apply to CSS? Here's my very opinionated perspective on this. And so let's look at details. This first one, automate or die. Whoops. Oh, I hate these when you copy the transitions you didn't expect. Automation. Um, Automation is easier than you think. Quick survey, how many people use a pre-compiler for almost everything they write? Ooh, yeah, okay. How many people should have raised their hands just now but didn't? Okay, good, thank you, honesty. All right, um, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt for people who come out of HTML and CSS and design about Precompilers. They're like, ooh, no, scary, difficult, hard, and really it's optional. Um, it's not uh, optional anymore. It's easier than you think. Um, and uh, I strongly, strongly recommend, if you're just getting started with it, try Yeoman. Yeoman provides you with an entire workflow that includes a compiler. Uh, it's tightly integrated with Compass, so you can give that a try, but try anything else. Um, but give it a try, don't be afraid of it, you will figure it out. Point number two, a new age is upon us. Um, I'm not going to belabor this point, but what I'm seeing all over the world, it started in New York and San Francisco and is making its way everywhere, is that the time is coming when it's going to be hard for us to have the jobs that we want to have if we say, nope, I'm just a, an HTML and CSS and light JavaScript guy. Um, this new age, I think, requires that almost everybody uh, get on board with automation, get on board with tooling, get on board with making your code more programmable, um, and, and even just with the idea that CSS isn't just presentation, it's not just style, it's code, and it needs to be maintained with the same tools that we use for other code. Um, Again, we could spend an entire session on millions of examples about why that is, about what a compiler gets you. Um, but here's a few. Um, oh, and yeah, a comparison. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in this room, everybody, everybody, everybody uses a reset or a normalizer, right? If you, if you aren't, you should. 
The browser doesn't make you do that. The technology doesn't require you when you first start writing your code to specify your normalizer file, right? Just like it doesn't force you to use Compass or Sass or Less or, or Stylus or whatever tool it is, whatever syntax it is that you like. But we accept now that it makes our code better. It makes our jobs easier. And I think it's time um, that it, it became a universal that we also understood the same thing about precompilers. All right, so everybody's heard, okay, anybody who's heard of a precompiler has heard that there are these things called variables, that there are these things called mix-ins. And the question is, what do they really get me? Okay, here's the first obvious thing. We talked about maintainability and how maintainability is about readability. How many people really like reading hex codes? Raise your hand. Who likes reading hex codes? Oh, and, and, and who prefers RGBA? That's a little easier, right? Because you can tell whether you added some opacity to it at the end, and if the number's really high, you know that it's really dark and rich, and if it's really low, you know that it's really light. That makes it easy, right? To know which color, which hex code, or which RGBA that you're looking at is ugly greenish blue, right? So why not just start naming things ugly greenish blue? Put that hex code in there once when you define your variable, and now every other time you look at it, it's written for your brain. It's written for you to understand. And now you're like, okay, I can get behind that, but where does the programming come in? The programming comes in when you realize that once you're dealing with ugly greenish blue, you can now do things like say, well, okay, yeah, I was gonna go to my color picker and mess around with the sliders until I figured out how to make five different darker and lighter versions of ugly greenish blue, or my red in this case. Or you can just use a compiler and let that compiler do it for you. And boom, instantly you've got all five of them and you're still using names that you understand. You're using ugly greenish blue minus 10% now, right? And everywhere in your application that you need it, you write ugly greenish blue minus 10% and you get it. And when the day comes that you're like, you know what, this version isn't dark enough, what I really need here is ugly greenish blue minus 20%, couple characters, you're done. You just saved yourself a lot of work. You saved the people who are coming after you trying to understand what you do. A lot of work and it's about a seemingly dopey little thing. Colors. Oh, and themes. Anybody ever do theming or want to do theming? A precompiler lets you define a few variables for one theme and then all of your base rules. Then define some other variables for your other theme. Same base rules. Mix and match. Boom. You've got two different themed style sheets, but you only wrote one style sheet. Um, it gives you stuff like that. That's awesome. And who's done responsive? Everybody wants responsive these days, right? Have you ever seen those monsters where there's an entire style sheet at one size and then an entire style sheet at another size and maybe two more after that? Or if it's not a whole separate style sheet, it's just one gigantic monster style sheet and first you have to wade through all the ones at the small size before you then finally get down to the ones that are the big size and the medium size and the ones in between? What if instead you could say, I've got this component and I want that at one size it's going to have a width of 78%. And at another break point, I want it to have a width of 50%. Or even, actually, at another break point, I just want it to disappear altogether. And I want it to do that in a way that's semantic, readable, easy to maintain. You can use mix-ins like this, please steal this, that allow you to do exactly that. Instead of three different style sheets, instead of um, making your life really difficult, you can use mix-ins and all of a sudden you're looking at something and you're saying, oh, when the screen is big, make it big. When the screen is medium, make it medium. When it's really tiny, make it disappear. All in one space, all together. All where you can get your brain around it after you've done 10 other things and come back and you're like, what was I thinking? Um, that's what programmability, that's what automation gets you. Um, and all of that, uh, just these few variables to define your screen sizes, these are actually based on the bootstrap, bootstrap screen sizes. Uh, should you find yourself trying to hack bootstrap to use their um, responsive patterns, it's actually fairly easy 
to just modify their, uh, their sizes by just changing these variables. All right, so what else can you do with the automation? Um, browser prefixes suck. Um, so you can use mix-ins, okay? Just define once that you need all these different browser prefixes for a particular feature. Slap in the mix-in wherever you're using that feature and you're done. Or, uh, bonus points, if you use Yeoman, you'll see that Yeoman has a, a tool called Auto Prefixer, okay? So Yeoman is the next level out. That's when you have your CSS, you're programming your CSS with Compass, then you're programming your entire application in an environment based on Node. Um, it'll change your life, truly. If you mess around with browser prefixes, this stuff will change your life. All right, next point. Oh. Name all the things. Um, I love this. I, I think it picks up on some memes, although actually I, I don't even have the pictures of, of, of the, the cool memes that it references, so it just sounds cute. But name all the things and name them clearly. So who was it that told us that this thing at the top, okay, where you aren't naming things, where you're just using element selectors, LIA, was a good idea? Why not just name those A's clearly, right? Why are we treating them like classes are something that need to be rationed? It's okay, um, and, and I recommend stop doing this um, using uh, element selectors, even when you're first roughing things out. Um, it's okay to use a class name that you're gonna change later. It's okay to use a class name that you're gonna change two or three times. That's a simple find and replace. What's not okay is when the new junior dev that you hire spends three months working around your redefinitions of UL and table before they finally get up the courage to ask, did you really mean to do that and can I change it, please? Um, what's even worse is when you come back to a project six months later and you can't figure out who on earth was responsible for doing something so foolish as to redefine core styles instead of naming them, um, and you realize you're the only one who's ever written any of the CSS. Um, that's bad. So stop rationing your classes, okay? We, we, we act, a lot of the stuff that we see on the web that tells us how to write our selectors and to do things like specific selector LIA, um, it acts like classes are radioactive. If you use too many of them uh, in too much proximity to each other, things will, will blow up. That for some reason, selectors without classes are cooler. Um, like classes are messing up our HTML, they're not. Um, they also like to make us feel clever. Uh, think about the first time that you ever used a pseudo selector, uh, like first child, or perhaps nth child three. Um, you're like, yeah, look what I just did, huh? You can't even see it's there, all right. Um, yeah, no, I, I've done that, everybody does that. Um, try it once, figure out how it works, and then rip it back out. Um, be afraid of that instinct to be clever, to, to do things that you want to reach over and point at somebody and say, look what I just did, um, because it, it, it'll end in pain. And speed-wise, classes are efficient as it gets, okay? There is no selector, literally, that is faster, not even in IDs. As far as I know, IDs and selectors are nearly always identical. Um, in speed or very nearly so, right? But specific selector space li space a is not, or is not the same. Um, so use clear descriptive classes so that you don't have to hunt for things, so that you don't have to guess where things are. Um, class names should tell us where to expect to find something. When we're looking at our CSS, when we're looking at our HTML, there should be a, a clear link between them. Now, sometimes the hardest thing about using good descriptive names is just inventing ones that make sense. Uh, that's why there are some great systems out there, BEM, OCS, Suit, um, they will help you do that. And um, a lot of the time when I recommend this to people, people say, well, I don't need to use BEM or BEM, however you like to pronounce it. I don't need to do that, I namespace. I namespace me some stuff. And uh, now, namespacing is not bad. 
But if what you're saying is that you want to use unforgivably general, unhelpful names for things, and that's okay because you namespace, you're saying, well, I've made it statistically improbable that I'll actually have a, com a collision at runtime. You're saying, I'm having a, I'm, I'm terrified of repeating that really embarrassing bug that we spent a week solving that was actually caused by giving two things the same name. And you're saying, I really don't give a rat's ass about making me and my fellow developers more efficient. I just care about avoiding embarrassment, okay? Namespacing is not a bad thing, but don't let it be a substitute for doing other things. And don't overdo it. We're gonna see an example of overdoing it in just a second. So we've talked about naming things clearly, and that gets us to um, element selectors and why I think that they're bad and why I think relying on the specificity algorithm to figure out which one we were talking about um, or thought we were talking about is bad. The specificity algorithm, okay, everybody who's heard of the specificity algorithm, right? It's that thing that makes those five different competing rules decide which one applies and which one doesn't, which rule shows up at the top in the Chrome Dev Tools and which ones show up further down in the bottom. Yeah, it's an algorithm. Yeah, it's math. And I made fun of the math guys earlier. But basically, it's long division by 417.23, carry the two, round to the nearest thousand, and spin around the mulberry bush, right? It's, it's not something that you can use meaningfully on a daily basis. And your backend guy, uh, that, that dabbler in CSS, is quite right to be suspicious of it when they look at your code and they see that you're relying on it, that you're using that as the way to distinguish between a whole bunch of element selectors and subselectors and descendant selectors that incorporate things with really vague, hard to maintain names. Um, so I strongly recommend avoiding element selectors, which are the number one reason that we wind up fighting the cascade um, and uh, hoping that the specificity algorithm is on our side today. Um, the one good use for them is resets and normalizers, okay? Or truly universal styles, like declaring this font everywhere, all the time, done. Um, or links, links are a good use of them because it's something that you'll use almost everywhere or everywhere, everywhere and never need to redefine it, never need to customize it, never need to style it in some sites. Not everybody does it that way. So what do we do to get around our, our vague element selectors, right? When we can't figure out how to get the rule that we want to apply up to the top of the list in the Chrome Dev, Dev Tools instead of being somewhere <coughs> further down, we use important. Using important is pretty much always a code smell. Um, code smell is a term that uh, people throw around a lot in other languages. Uh, it, it means, in a nutshell, um, it just, I can't explain quite why this is wrong in 10 seconds or less. It's just not. It smells funny. It, it just throws off that odor of not being something that I'm going to be able to maintain. Important is pretty much always a code smell. So consider, um, again, we can't go into the details here. Consider using something like extend or include in your precompiler to create a narrower class to be able to redefine your classes easily rather than fight the existing one. Um, and where is, so we're finally going to get, we're gonna stop talking, we're gonna talk about nesting, okay? This is, this is the final nesting, and nesting can mean descendant selectors, it can be over nesting in our CSS. I'm, I'm fusing a couple things together here. And we're gonna get to a description very shortly, uh, I think, um, of BEM. So the general use of descendant selectors, where you've got these three different rules somewhere in your website, um, fighting with each other, competing with each other, overlapping, this is anathema to knowing what's gonna happen. Okay, to being predictable, to being readable. And yet, we've been taught to do it since day one, right? Doing specific thing, space LI, space A, it's in like all the manuals, all the tutorials, all the guidebooks about how selectors work. 
right? Um, but they lock your content into a single context, making it really hard to reuse it someplace else or move it to someplace else. It also makes it really hard to move anything else into a given context, right? So you use a descendant selector on, um, on, uh, on some stuff and then you try to drop in a jQuery date picker or something, well, guess what? It has tons more of those same elements that you just redefined using a descendant selector and now those are all descendants of what you created. Another kind of nesting. A lot of folks, when they start using precompilers, particularly if they come from a worldview that is all about um, namespacing, is they'll say, oh great, fantastic, Compass will let me namespace the crap out of every single CSS rule that I ever write, and then I'll get this visual indication that this second rule in purple is inside of that other rule in purple, and then that other one is inside of that. And what you wind up with is this example over here at the top, where you, you're five deep, and we've only gotten like 20 lines down this CSS file. I have seen examples of this where to address a single element on a single page, people are using descendant selectors with 20 or 30 or 40 components. That's really, really inefficient. Um, I'm not here to make specific points about inefficiency. I can tell you with, for a fact, absolutely <clears throat> uncertain, with, with no uncertainty, that nesting your selectors 40 deep is always bad, <laughs> always. Um, Whereas there is zero difference performance-wise at runtime between a class that has two letters in its name and a class that has 50 letters in its name, okay? Think about that, think about that difference. Think about the typing issue. Oh, I don't wanna type all those extra characters. Well, you'll be able to read it, you'll understand what it does, and it runs as fast or faster than anything else that you've ever been taught to do. Um, and the most important thing that you can understand performance-wise is that selectors work from right to left, okay? So that thing we do where there's the ID, space LI, space A, we think, oh, well, I'm starting with the most specific piece over there on the left, which means that I've narrowed it down, man. I found the one tiny little piece, and then it's okay if I just say, well, give me all the LIs inside of that. That's not how it works. It's actually the opposite of that. When the CSS matcher, implements your rules, it's gonna go through the entire page and find all of whatever's on the right. So if you're doing specific selector, then semi-specific selector, then LI, then A, it starts with all the A's, every single one, and then goes, I should call them anchors, it starts with all the anchors, and goes up from there. It has to reparse the entire tree of elements above every single A on the entire page to find out which of them contains all of these additional elements. Or you can use a single class. So the fact that we can do stuff, the fact that the specificity algorithm and the cascade let us do this doesn't mean that we should. And in fact, I would argue that we should try, start getting away from it. Um, you can nest things without stacking. This is a general example of one variant, one syntax of BEM, where you can use the ampersand over here to nest one style within another style to indicate that they're related, that you're always gonna find one within the other, but then the actual compiled CSS down at the bottom does not actually make, turn them into descendant selectors. This gives you all the same readability, all the same ability to express where you expect to find something without all of the overhead, without all of the inefficiency. All the same benefits, none of the disadvantages. Um, and if you don't like those systems, then at least just use, start using indentation uh, for your namespacing instead of putting everything inside of everything else. So rule of thumb, nest selectors and stack classes when you have to, not just when the browser will let you. Um, and nest and stack, whenever possible, mix-ins and extends rather than your selectors themselves. If you do that, if you use descriptive classes rather than ones that you've stacked a mile deep, it means that refactoring is easy, overrides 
if they're necessary, happen exactly where you can see them in your code instead of it being something that you have to puzzle out in the browser, in the dev tools. And if it comes time to refactor for performance, a lot of the, the performance folks are like, no, 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 man, I have to use stacked classes because I have to be able to reuse these most commonly uh, accessed chunks of style. If you, it's, if you take those most commonly accessed chunks of style and make them into a mix-in, it's easy to refactor them into a separate class, but it's really hard to go the other way. So pros and cons, um, there's quite a few, but we're going to blow through them in general. Um, try not to. And think about how many of the reasons that we stack our classes are because uh, they're waving the you got to go sign at me in the back. How many of the reasons that we stack our classes are because we don't, those of you who don't use precompilers yet can't see this, but once you do use them, you'll be like, oh, I was doing that because I didn't have this, okay? Um, and so our very last point that I have like 10 seconds, avoid unnecessarily complexity. That means don't use elements because somebody told you you should. Don't use things just because somebody told you they're semantic. And don't feel guilty not doing it. Use the most flexible elements you can get um, and not the ones that you think you're supposed to use. Use the ones that let you write maintainable code. And avoid the pseudo selectors. Um, it's not that they're never ever okay, um, but you should use them as a last resort when you have to. Um, not because it'll make you feel clever to uh, to find a way to squeeze it in, to get that number two item to have a different style than that number one item. There's probably another way. Thank you. Yeah, so you've kind of like gone against the grain of a, a, you know, a lot of standard practice. Do you have any suggestions for like further reading and stuff like that? Like where would you start um, in this approach? The, um, yeah, the one thing I don't have in this presentation is like a see also my references. Right. Um, the, I think you can get a lot of what I'm going for by reading the documentation around uh, BEM. Uh, BEM is not the only one, it's not my favorite one, but it seems to be the one that's getting a lot of action right now. And it's the one that's focused on naming things well, on declarative, clear names, on being able to, whenever possible, have, be able to look at your code, see what it means, and have there be, preferably, when possible, one class on it. Um, that documentation and then read the articles about people arguing back and forth about which parts of that are good and which parts of that are bad, which parts mess with performance, which parts don't, that is probably the best available right now. I don't think anybody has written a book about this approach. Um, that and compilers. You know, the document, the, the compiler documentation and API, tutorials about how to do that and why to do that. Um, these are, to me, the best sources right now of how to start writing clearer, more maintainable CSS.